Okay. Um, just a quick indicator on your chat at the bottom. Could you just say if you can hear the sound? Good, thank you. Okay, so welcome again to the COVID-19 uh, training webinar that is facilitated by the National Institute for Occupational Health. This particular webinar is done in partnership with the Wits Health Consortium and thankfully has been um, funded by the Health and Welfare CETA. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you. I'm Ashraf Raycliffe, the National Health and Safety Training Manager at the NIH. And uh, this is part of a series. I've kind of lost track a little bit. I think we're probably are around number 40 of our webinars since the early March. So this particular session that we're dealing with today is looking at the return to work post COVID-19 illness. So if you've had a colleague or maybe yourself had been unfortunately uh, infected with COVID-19, um, what happens after your recovery? And how does workplace preparedness um, prepare for that? Okay, so this is a very important topic. It's a logical extension of the series of topics we've had since March. And it's important for you to take as much as you can from our presenters today, which I'll, who I will introduce in a moment, as well as go to our website to make sure that when this video presentation is on or uploaded there, that you can access the website. The website itself is zero rated by um, an all, I think all or a number of the mobile service providers, including an internet service provider. So it's important for you then to access these resources there and ensure that the impact in the workplace is a very positive one. Okay, um, so I want to thank the NIH team and the Wits Health Consortium team who's involved organizing the session, in particular Dr. Mpumi Ndaba for coordinating all of our program and presenters as well. Um, I'm doing this thanks to you on behalf of Dr. Tanusha Singh, who's the head of our COVID-19 outbreak response team. She's unfortunately unable to do this today due to another important engagement. I want to just find out if Mr. Segi Pillay is online. Segi, are you there? Yes, uh, Ashraf, I am. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. And please, um, if you could do the introduction, I'm handing over to you. Thank you very much, Afra, uh, Ashraf. Appreciate that. Uh, can I get access to the camera? There you go. Okay, brilliant. Uh, colleagues, good morning. Uh, Ashraf, thank you for this opportunity. I'll just take up a minute or two of your time. Uh, it's really just a very short introduction. I wanted to make uh, two or three different points. The first is that uh, Witzel Consortium, who's uh, managing this grant from the Health and Welfare CETA, is really privileged to be uh, part of this partnership with uh, the National Institute for Occupational Health, which is a division of the National Health Laboratory Service. Um, you know, the uh, NIOH is an organization with decades of experience and uh, this is something, they have a team of experts that uh, do these training programs and it really is a significant uh, privilege for us to partner with NIOH to deliver these programs at, at this point in time. We also appreciate the fact that at very short notice, they put together these programs in response uh, to the needs uh, that were identified uh, after discussion with the uh, labor, with the uh, the National Minister of Higher Education and uh, Training and, uh, and the Health and Welfare CETA. And to that extent, you know, we, we really, uh, really privileged and also um, uh, really appreciate the outstanding uh, response from the Health and Welfare CETA to the request for funding to run these training programs. When the, when the second uh, announcement was made by our president for the lifting of the uh, restrictions, and we were anticipating 8,000 workers, uh, 8 million workers returning to work. The uh, need for these training programs became quite uh, obvious and, and evident. And the Health and Welfare CETA very kindly 
agreed at short notice, make the funding available. Our partners at short notice put together the content and, uh, and started running these uh, programs. So I really, I know that from uh, looking at the feedback that we're getting from the previous sessions, the programs uh, uh, respond to the needs of people that are on the ground and the programs um, are really uh, valued by the different participants. But to make the point that the, the participation is really focused to shop stewards, to occupational health and safety workers, to leadership in unions, to management and to employers. And it's, uh, it's, providing, it's providing information to enable us all to play different roles in the uh, management of the, uh, of the virus and the pandemic as it uh, sort of unfolds. Uh, hopefully, you know, shop stewards uh, can play the role of ensuring that management is, understands what needs to be done and they are doing what they should be do doing to ensure that the workplaces are safe that they themselves can contribute and participate in the discussion because we have a collective responsibility for not just our individual safety, but more importantly, for the safety of our colleagues, our families, for the people that we shop with, for the people that we travel with. And therefore, if every one of us took, made our little contribution, the collective effort is going to be that we're going to um, see through this difficult period and hopefully when a vaccine becomes available, we'll feel a lot safer. But at this particular point in time, with this information, with this knowledge, with these skills that are being transferred by NIOH to all of you, the most important thing is that individually, we are learning to live side by side with the, with the virus. And collectively, we taking the steps to ensure that we can protect our health and, and our safety. Uh, one final comment for those individuals that have difficulty with data, the health and welfare CETA has made some funding available to make uh, data available. Uh, I just make an appeal that when you're chatting to your colleagues and you're chatting to your friends, et cetera, uh, just to sensitize them to the fact that this data is there to enable people that can't participate in the program uh, because data is an obstacle. And if there are going to be abuses of the data, it makes it very difficult for us to control this. And unfortunately, at this time, there's um, quite large groups of people that seem to be abusing the data. So, you know, I appeal to our, our uh, union colleagues, our labor colleagues, I appeal to management and others, you know, please get out the message that data is really there to increase access for individuals that uh, can't get access. Um, but uh, if we can use that, uh, that privilege almost uh, in the most responsible way that we, we can. Uh, Asha, thank you very much for this opportunity. I hope that all of you will get uh, value out of this program, but most importantly that you will use that information to ensure that you are safe and that we are safe. You see that. Thank you, Segi. Um, thank you for the uh, introduction and welcome there and giving background. We encourage people just to abide by the conditions upon which the Health and Welfare Center has made these resources available. So again, welcome to the Return to Work Post-COVID-19 Illness Webinar convened by the National Occup Occupational, uh, National Institute for Occupational Health. Got that one wrong. Okay. And in partnership with the Wits Health Consortium and with the support of the Health and Welfare Center. So our program today um, is first the return to work post COVID-19 illness slash lockdown. And that's going to be done by my colleague, Dr. Mollen Mogambo in, from the occupational medicine section. And I'll give a more formal introduction later. The following that is the control for workplace high risk areas by Dr. Sayuri Pillay. Um, of the WIT School for Public Health um, slash NIH. Huh? And then cleaning post-COVID-19 infected workers in, in the workplace. Um, so that's by Dr. Shalene Andros, the toxicology section at NIH. And then we're looking at the practical experience from an occupational medical practitioner point of view. And that's Dr. Tendo, the occupational medical practitioner um, at the Charlotte Matrike Hospital. 
Okay, so that's the program. And um, at this point, I'm now going to request my colleague, uh, Dr. Marlon Mogambo, to join us. And if Glenn could just put up the presentation in the meantime. A quick admin before Glenn puts up the presentation. So I'm pointing down to the Q&A. Please, questions there for presentations. Anything else, admin and anything else, please, it's over there in the chat box. And if you've got questions with regard to the data, please email hwstraining at witzhealth.co.za. That's hwstraining at witzhealth.co.za. So I now welcome Dr. Marlon Mogambo. She's an occupational medicine specialist in the occupational medicine section of the National Institute for Occupational Health. And I welcome her. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, today I'll be speaking about uh, return to work post COVID illness or post lockdown. Uh, just a quick update on the statistics. Uh, internationally, as of yesterday, we are now sitting at 13 million. Um, and 42,564 cases with 571 um, deaths. Uh, bringing it closer to home uh, in South Africa, we are now sitting at 272,242 cases with about 4,000 deaths. And looking in the workplace, uh, looking at healthcare workers, we're now sitting at um, 4,821 cases. And these deaths is from the, the last deaths was done on the 30th of June. And with the correctional services, we are sitting at 3,424 cases with 29 deaths. In the mining industry, we're sitting at 3,519 cases with 28 um, deaths. So looking at these states, um, we see that uh, there's a, a, a major reasons why we need to um, uh, change the way we work in the workplaces as we prepare to open up for those who are still on lockdown. And since um, these are just a few major milestones that have occurred since um, the 11th of March, when WHO declared uh, coronavirus as a global pandemic. So on the 27th of March, uh, South Africa entered a countrywide lockdown, which was aimed at uh, flattening the COVID-19 infection curve. So since then, a lot of workplaces have not returned to work. Just a few uh, essential um, workplaces have opened up. And on the 23rd of April, um, President Ramaphosa announced the first uh, reopening of the economy. And since then, um, we have had a few um, workplaces that have opened up. And currently, we are sitting on day 104 or five today of lockdown and on stage three of the lockdown. So we're going to see a lot more of the workplaces opening up. So. Regarding this, uh, there's need to continue or keep the economic engine rolling despite the COVID-19 um, pandemic. We need to keep our economy going. And opening up um, timelines for different workplaces will differ according to the business and on where we are in terms of the infection. So who is it that is returning to work? We have people that have been working remotely that will have to return to um, their workplaces. We have uh, more workplaces that are opening up post lockdown. And we also have those people who have been infected or affected by the COVID-19 who are returning to work post their illness and post quarantine. 
And we've also had some workplaces, essential workers that have been working on reduced workload, now with the rest of the team joining them. COVID-19 is a recognized workplace hazard, just like any other biological um, hazards. And it is up to the employer to provide a safe working environment for each of their employees. And with regard to those um, workplaces that are opening up from lockdown, it is the employer's duty to make sure that they reopen when it is safe to do so. So what are some of the effects that COVID-19 has on the workplace? It creates absenteeism due to sickness. We have people that are caring for their sick loved ones back home. There's interrupted supply or delivery due to delayed or canceled um, orders as a result of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. We also have consumer demand increase in, um, in respirators and other forms of PPE. So in those cases, there's need for more workers to be at work. When does the employer make the decision to um, reopen? These are some of the things that the employer needs to consider before they can reopen. They need to think of, is it necessary to reopen? Is it safe for them to reopen? They have to determine which workers, which of the workers will return first. They have to do health risk assessments to update this, the risk assessment that they, that they have already done in the light of COVID-19. Develop workplace uh, preparedness and response plans. These are procedures for responding when there's an employee, customer, or any other person that may be present in the workplace when they become ill with symptoms of COVID-19. They need to prepare the workplace for the return of workers, considering all the other hierarchy of controls that have been presented in the previous presentations. They need to make sure that the workers are all aware about the return to work plans and procedures that they've put into place. So these are some of the policies, protocols, and preparedness plans that um, are recommended for the employers to consider. So this needs to be agreed upon by the relevant players, which are the managers, the HR people, occupational health and safety workers and their unions. They need to have a remote working policy hand washing policy, social distancing policy, and a planned response policy in place in case there's a positive COVID-19 um, case. How they will do the contact tracing, who is going to be tested, and how the testing will be done, as well as disinfecting the places um, when there's an ill person. Isolation procedures, cleaning and disinfection, employee screening protocols, use of masks, and what type of masks they'll, they'll be using within their workplaces. Leave policies, procedures for employees returning to work after a suspected or a confirmed case of COVID-19, how those people will be incorporated back into the workplace. Isolation procedures, and um, they, they will need to establish workplace mental well-being support through the EAPs within the workplace. All these actions, the policies and protocols will need to have a responsible person allocated to make sure these are done. Just a short plan on how to return to work 
we need to understand how the virus is transmitted. Make the workplace safe. Establish a COVID-19 response team and a COVID-19 compliance officer who will make sure that all the relevant controls and plans and policies will be taken into effect. In all this, we need to engage the staff. Employee education and training about the virus, how it is transmitted and how they can protect themselves. Encourage good hygiene within the workplace and update the policies and procedures. Remember, COVID-19 is a novel virus, so they currently no one has any pol policies or procedures on how to manage COVID-19. So there is need for every workplace to update their policies and procedures in respect to COVID-19. We need to prioritize screening within the workplace, do contact tracing whenever there's a positive case, and manage the health, the mental health of the employees. Above all, we need to monitor and review and learn from our mistakes. Look back at all the forms of uh, controls whenever there is a positive case to assess where did we go wrong and how we can improve. Approach to return to work. Firstly, we need to do a work, I mean a risk assessment a workplace assessment to assess any feasibility of social distancing within the workplace. In cases where social distancing is not feasible, what other controls can be put into place to protect the employees? Ensure that there is good hygiene measures and PPE provided. On top of that, we need to do an individual assessment for each and every employee. Are there any pregnant women? To an individual assessment to assess their vulnerability. Are there any pregnant women, elderly? Are there any of the employees with any underlying conditions, as well as the gender? So these assessments will help us better protect the individual workers. Employees need to be trained in the appropriate language that they will understand about signs, symptoms, and the risk of contracting COVID-19. Where, how, and what are the sources within the workplace that may result in them being exposed to COVID-19. They need to be trained on how to prevent the spread of SARS-CoV-2 at work. The employees need to be reassured on what the employer is doing to protect them. Are they wearing any um, face cloth coverings in the workplace? Are there any employer, are there any new employee policies that have been brought into place with regard to COVID-19? All these things the, the workers need to be trained on and they need to know how to protect themselves within the workplace. A risk management needs to be done. So I'm not going to talk about risk management because we, we have had this uh, presentation before. This is when we look at the hierarchy of controls on how to protect ourselves within the workplace. There is also need to have an ongoing screening program to ensure that anyone that is coming into the workplace is protected. This can be ensured through a questionnaire that assesses symptoms on a daily basis. Employees should understand the implications of the questionnaire. In cases where they respond to a yes in any of the questions, they should know what happens thereafter. So in this case, 
this is when the policies come into place. If there is a policy that uh, talks about what to do in case of um, a, a positive um, screening, um, when there's a positive um, answer to a screening questionnaire. We also need to encourage anyone that is sick to stay at home and have a plan for when an employee gets sick on how they will be transported from the workplace to healthcare centers or whether there's an available occupational health service, how they'll get to the occupational health service from their workstation. So there should be a plan on how that should be done. And we need to regularly communicate with the employees when there is new developments within the local authorities, that is new guidelines and regulations. And this will also mean that they need to be a new risk assessment that needs to be done. With regards to mental health issues, there has been a high rise of mental health issues within the workplace as a result of isolation, caring responsibilities for those who are sick at home. And also within the workplace, there has been social distancing within the job sites. This creates a sense of loneliness within the workplace. Mental health issues with regards to stigma of those that have tested positive, as well as financial difficulties and debts with, um, with decrease in the workload. There is also those that have lost their loved ones due to COVID-19 and the use of substance and alcohol abuse in order to deal with all these uh, situations. These are some of the issues that employers need to be aware of and encourage employees to seek counseling should they find themselves in any of these um, circumstances. There's also need to support individuals within the workplace. Those workers that are struggling at work due to common health problems that puts them at risk of contracting COVID-19. There may be other problems that may have emerged since they left work before lockdown. So in this respect, we need, the employees need, employers need to support their workers by providing them with EAP um, support. Just a plan for when there is an infected employee. We need to provide support to other employees. Reassure the rest of the staff that you are handling the situation. Provide EAP support that will assist with counseling and psychological support for all the affected employees. Provide suitable sick leave for the days for 14 days for the one that has been affected by COVID-19. 14 days is just a minimum time of isolation. It might be longer depending on how ill the person will become. If the infection was occupationally acquired, then the employer needs to submit compensation claim to Department of Labor. We need to establish how that employee got infected, who was affected, and we need also to identify who was, who was affected and do a contact tracing to those who have been affected and provide quarantining for them as well. There needs to be cleaning of the contaminated areas any area that the infected person has been in contact with within the last 48 hours of testing positive. If it's more than seven days, it may not be necessary to do cleaning. Depending on how many employees 
are involved, they, it may be necessary to temporarily close the work site while investigations are underway. Return to work for a post-COVID, post return to work for post-COVID illness. Return to work should be according to your workplace absence policy. Self-isolation of any other symptoms. The person needs to keep self-isolating if there are any other symptoms such as high temperature, runny nose, vomiting or diarrhea until these symptoms settle. One does not need to repeat a test after 14 days of isolation or quarantine to return to work. So workers, employers should not ask employees for a negative test in order for them to return to work. An employee can return to work 14 days after quarantine or when their symptoms have disappeared. A health assessment needs to be done. In doing this one, doing a symptom review does the person still have symptoms and ensure that the employee has no residual effects from the cause of disease, such as um, difficulty in breathing. If the person was positive and is, and is symptomatic when they got ill, they can only return to work after three days having passed since recovery, defined as resolution of the symptoms, or at least 14 days have passed since symptoms first appeared. If they were positive and asymptomatic, they can only return to work at least 14 days after 14 days have passed since the positive laboratory test. So when they return to work, they still need to continue wearing their face covering, continue with social distancing, and they need to adhere to hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, as well as cough etiquette. They need to continue self-monitoring themselves for any symptoms. The employer and the employee need to engage on the following. Make sure that post-COVID illness, the employee is ready to return to work. They need to talk about any work updates that have happened while they were off. Look at any recommendations made by the occupational health practitioners. See if there's any need to support the employee. If the employee has had post-COVID disability or are vulnerable, they need to see if there are any changes that can be done within the workplace to accommodate the employee. Consider referrals to a medical service such as occupational health service to assess for fitness for duty and when they can return to work. Discuss any need for EAP with the employer, with the employee. In conclusion, there's significant need for changes to people's daily lives and how they work in order to accommodate uh, COVID-19 pandemic. There is obviously fear about returning to work post lockdown, post COVID illness, the employers need to reassure their employees about appropriate risk assessments and mitigations. Discussion of employees' ideas, concerns, and expectations. Above all, communication between the employer and the employees is very important in all this. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, Monal Mogambo, Dr. Mogambo, from the Occupational Medicine section of the NOH.
and she dealt with the return to work post COVID-19 illness slash lockdown. I think it's an excellent summary of quite a lot of the webinars we've done before in setting the scene for the key question we're asking today. What do you need to do in the workplace to ensure that the return to work post COVID illness and lockdown for those who have not yet returned is in place? Our next uh, presenter on the control of workplace high risk areas is Dr. Sayuri Pillay from the Witt School for Public Health. One moment. I just forgot my um, clipboard. Okay. So, as a brief introduction, Dr. Sayuri Pillay is part of the Witt School of Public Health team as a public health medicine registrar. She holds an MBCHB from the University of Pretoria, where she qualified in 2015 and went on to study a diploma in tropical medicine and hygiene through the University of Witwatersrand in 2019. Previously, Sayuri completed an internship in Durban at both Addington and the Mahatma Gandhi hospitals. And then her community service year at Charlotte Makeke Johannesburg Academic Hospital with time specifically spent in emergency medicine as well as pediatrics. Most recently, she was working as a medical officer in the Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital and completed a diploma in child health care and numerous courses during that time. So Yuri has a particular interest in preventative medicine and is looking forward to forging ahead with that direction together with the rest of the department. Prevent disease, promote health, and prolong life. I welcome Dr. Sayuri Pillay. So, Glenn, if you could just get that presentation. Thank you very much. So, welcome. Thank you. Is the sound okay? Everyone can hear me. Okay. Morning, everyone. As Ashra said, my name is Dr. Sayuri Pillay. Um, I'm going to be giving a short presentation on the high-risk transmission areas in the workplace and how to mitigate the risk. And I apologize in advance for any repetition, but it's always good to have a reminder on uh, these things. So, your worker has completed their 14 days of isolation and their healthcare worker has written a letter saying that they can now return to work. I want you to bear in mind that even if they've recovered from COVID-19, they need to be aware of the risk, and here's why. So number one, reinfection may be a possibility. According to Professor Shabir Mahdi, who is a professor of vaccinology at WITS and who is heading up the vaccine trial for COVID-19 in South Africa, after a patient becomes infected, many of them lose their antibodies after two to three months. So although it doesn't mean that everyone doesn't have underlying immunity after COVID-19 infection, it just points towards the possibility of reinfection. The same idea was confirmed by The Lancet and the King's College in London, who stated that they saw steep drops in antibody levels just three months after COVID-19 infection. This phenomenon is still being researched by the CDC and WHO, but basically it's just pointing towards the fact that everyone is at risk. Number two, the number of cases in SA are rising exponentially. It's evident to see that the total number of cases in South Africa are rising exponentially on a day-to-day -day basis. We've surpassed now 287,000 cases nationally, and that actually puts us in the top 10 countries worldwide with the most amount of COVID-19 cases. Number three, a high number of bacteria and viruses are transmitted in the workplace. So the no workplace is a breeding ground for all viruses and bacteria, and this is a known fact. Um, it's often because it's small shared spaces with high levels of interaction for long periods of time. So we need to bear that in mind. And number four, that person or worker is still at risk of transporting the virus back home and into the community. So minimal exposure is necessary, especially those who live with people who are elderly or have comorbidities. So before we discuss the workplace and high-risk areas, from previous sessions held on comorbidities and vulnerable workers that are available on the NIOH website, it's important to note that if an employee's job can be done at home or another low-risk area, then they should be afforded the opportunity to work from that area to decrease their risk of exposure. 
So going through what my colleague just um, said as well, just a quick recap, what should be in place already? There should be a workplace preparedness plan. There should be a designated COVID compliance officer in the workplace. You should have done or be thinking about doing a health risk assessment or a workplace assessment for your employees. And this includes knowing vulnerable workers, the controls and engineering, having policies and SOPs in place, and thinking about specific PPE for your workplace. It would be good to have an isolation room available for vulnerable workers and screening on entry into the workplace in terms of temperature and symptoms checklist. So, which are the high risk transmission areas? Number one is the tea room, the biggest culprit. So according to the BBC, in an article describing the top eight things that South Africa could teach the rest of the continent in terms of COVID-19, the tea rooms were noted as one of the biggest culprits in helping to spread coronavirus. It's typically a place where people socialize and eat, so there's no wearing of masks, very little social distancing, and passing or sharing of utensils, foods, and cell phones, making it extremely high risk. Number two is shared spaces. This refers to indoor gatherings such as meetings, staff rooms, even lifts, even corridors where there's high amounts of foot traffic. These areas are all high risk because of the lack of physical distancing. Number three is shared equipment or highly used surfaces. This refers to door handles, desks, pens used at signing in, computers, keyboards, headphones in call centers or in factories, shared machinery or vehicles. It's all business dependent. Number four is bathrooms. So bathrooms are high risk, again, because of door handles, because of stall handles and taps. And in bathrooms, it's important because these areas are not typically cleaned after each person. Number five is your personal office space. So this depends on the type of office that you're in, whether it's a shared space or cubicle, and how many people are being let into your office at any given time, where they sit and what they touch. All things to keep in mind. And number six, just public transportation. So if your workers are using public transportation like buses or trains, it's important to be aware of the risk that's carried and for this to be a part of your risk assessment. So as I mentioned before, it's wise to do a health risk assessment and a workplace assessment as high risk areas are workplace specific. So this was explained really well, not just in the presentation that you just heard, but also in Friday's webinar that's available on the NIOH website. So just quickly to go through this, but I'm sure my colleague will discuss it later on as well. How long does a virus last on surfaces? So the WHO released a statement saying that studies have shown that COVID-19 can survive for up to 72 hours on plastic and stainless steel, less than four hours on copper and less than 24 hours on cardboard. And as you can see in the diagram that I've put there, about three hours on paper and tissue paper. These lifespans are all temperature and humidity specific, but it's good to have an idea of how long the virus lasts if it's not being cleaned. So what can be done to lower the risk? As I mentioned before, if an employee can work by, uh, from home, they should be allowed to do so. So that's number one. Screening, so important. Before entering the workplace, it has to be done. This can be done by checking temperatures or having a symptom checklist. It's important to make sure that whoever is in charge of screening is aware of the normal and abnormal values with temperature screening and that each person entered is, checking, is checked properly and that their details are captured for contact tracing. There are various screening tools and apps available to make this easier. Sanitizing stations should be used in as many areas as possible, especially entry or exit points and high traffic areas such as the tea room, corridors and outside lifts. In a workplace, if possible, PPE should be supplied to employees as dictated by your health risk assessment. Training should be done for all employees and this is nice because it's a chance to talk to your employees and provide information and keep them up to date. It also gives them a chance to put forward their own ideas to you. It can include how to correctly use PPE, symptom awareness, and what to do if one suspects COVID-19 in the workplace. Posters should be used around the office or friendly reminders sent via email or text on the importance of hand washing, wearing a mask, and physical distancing. Cleaning of highly used surfaces and equipment 
needs to be done almost all the time. An important thing to note with this is that it could be a good idea to provide each office or area with cleaning supplies, as employees should be encouraged to clean their own surfaces, especially highly used surfaces as discussed before, and bins can be provided for the correct disposal of waste and medical waste. Well-ventilated rooms must be utilized with open windows for good airflow. Even though it's winter and it's cold and everyone tends to want to keep everything closed, it's really important to have well-ventilated rooms. Avoid group work unless it can be done online. Avoid sharing of documents and stationery. Avoid overcrowded rooms and meetings. Use staggering or flexible shifts and break times. This is especially important because it will help reduce the risk from public transport as well, so that, the pay, that your workers can avoid the uh, morning rush hour. High-risk employees should be provided with their own offices or areas, and isolation rooms or areas should be established for acutely unwell employees. And the most important, adopting the concept of the new normal. So these are things that everyone has heard of, and they're the public health interventions that were put in place to prevent the spread of the virus. So they are as follows, physical distancing by at least 1.5 meters. So in the workplace, physical distancing is much easier to do when it's been marked out already. So use floor tape or paint to mark your work areas, Use screens to create a physical barrier between people. Have your workers working side by side rather than face to face. And try to limit the movement of people around the workplace. Wear a mask in all public areas and corridors. As you now know from Sunday, it's mandatory to wear a mask. So depending on the type of workplace, different masks can be used. For now, most places and employees should don a cloth face mask. In healthcare facilities or areas, a medical mask is advised, or an N95, depending on the worker's risk of exposure. Encourage your employees to wash their hands often for at least 20 seconds with soap and water, or to use a more than 60% alcohol-based hand sanitizer. So encourage your employees to wash their hands as often as possible, or to sanitize. Um, and this can be done also by providing wash or touchless sanitize stations around the workplace with soap, water, and paper towels available. Providing your workers with PPE comes in handy here as employees are more likely to sanitize when they have sanitizer with them. Encourage them to practice good cough and sneeze etiquette, which is coughing or sneezing into your elbow or into a tissue, throwing it away, and then washing your hands. Avoid touching your face and encourage workers to stay at home whenever feeling unwell. So I've included a diagram here that just shows the risk moving from outside the office towards inside the office. And as you can see, when you're at home, you have the lowest risk. Outdoor activities are moderate risk when you're surrounded by people, but there's still a bit of space. Outdoor gatherings, when you have a lot of people, but out open and outside has a higher risk. And when you're indoor, with a lot of people, it's the highest risk. So this is referring to having meetings inside the workplace. So it's important to know your alternatives that are available, whether you want to do online meetings or phone calls. And there are certain things to remember if you have to have a meeting. So if you have to have a meeting with your staff before the meeting, it's important to give PPE and make sure that it's available in terms of sanitizers, tissues, and masks. Advise your employees that if they're feeling unwell, they should stay at home. Make sure that everyone gives their details for contact tracing before the meeting starts and agree on a response plan if someone gets ill during the meeting. During the meeting, it's nice to start with a brief training session or intro. Ensure that everyone is wearing their face mask. Encourage employees to use sanitizers. Make sure that social distancing is adhered to and open the windows to ensure good ventilation. After the meeting, it's just important to keep the contact details of the participants of the meeting for at least up to a month, so that if someone does fall ill, you're able to inform all the participants. So again, another image on how important it is to wear a mask and that it protects not only yourself, but others. So this just shows that if you have a COVID-19 carrier without a mask and you're also not wearing a mask, the risk of spread is high. 
Whereas if both people are wearing masks, the risk of spread becomes very low. So post COVID-19 infection, if your worker is coming back to work, it's important that they wear a surgical mask or medical mask for at least 21 days post initial test as per the Department of Labor. All other workers in the workplace can wear a mask appropriate for their work area. And on a last note, according to the NICD and other sources, there has been no recorded case of a person shedding infectious virus after 14 days. So there is no reason why a person should be treated any differently after returning to the workplace post isolation. Dealing with stigma surrounding COVID-19, especially in the workplace, there's no room for discrimination. If an employee is returning to work post COVID illness, they must still monitor themselves daily. They need to monitor if any symptoms arise and if so, they need to isolate and inform their doctor. It's important to keep up to date with the latest news surrounding COVID-19. So keep watching and attending these training webinars. And lastly, more knowledge equals less fear. So be kind to address fear during coronavirus pandemic, show empathy with those affected, learn about the disease to assess the risks and adopt practical measures to stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Sayuri uh, uh Dealing with the topic um, of control of workplace high risk areas, I think there was a number of very important new facts for me in that presentation as well, in terms of questions of uh, reinfection. A colleague in my passage at work asked me that question yesterday and today it's been answered. So moving on to our next presenter, I welcome Dr. Charlene Andreas from the NRH's toxicology section. And Charlene will deal with the cleaning post-COVID-19 of infected workers and the workplaces. I hope I've got that properly correct. Yes, that is the same thing, yes. Thanks. Okay, so I have previously given a presentation on the guidelines on routine and deep cleaning in the workplace. And this is available on the NIOH website. However, for today's presentation, I will be answering seven of the most popular questions that we have received uh, thus far. And the first question is, what is the difference between cleaning and disinfecting? Uh, what is the difference between regular day-to-day -day routine cleaning and deep cleaning? The third is, why is fogging as a deep cleaning method not recommended? Uh, the fourth is, should a business be closed for deep cleaning when a COVID-19 positive case is identified? And should I deep clean every time a positive case is identified? Uh, third last question, should I get an external uh, cleaning company to conduct deep cleaning and do I need a certificate of cleaning? Uh, what is required from the employer if in-house cleaning staff should conduct cleaning? And then the last question, when and how should I clean or disinfect certain items? Now, another good resource together with the NIOH website is a talk that was given by the Chief Inspector, Mr. Zana. And this was given on uh, the 17th of June, uh, which was hosted by the South African Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. And this YouTube video uh, is a two hour presentation and it discusses quite a lot of um, factors that we are facing currently during the pandemic. Okay, so I like to always start off with a few definitions. And the first is cleaning. Now this involves the use of water, detergent, soap and mechanical friction to reduce pathogen load, organic matter and dirt. Now, it's important to know that a detergent does not kill pathogens. Uh, disinfection, on the other hand, is a type of decontamination using disinfectants to kill almost 100% of pathogens. The drawback of disinfectants is that they are easily deactivated by organic matter and dirt. So it is therefore always important to clean first to reduce pathogen load, organic matter and dirt, and then disinfect to kill the remaining pathogens. Now sanitizing, that is the lowering uh, of the number of pathogens to a safe level 
by either cleaning or what I call a lower level of disinfection. And sterilizing, that is a type of decontamination using heat and steam, often via autoclave. Decontamination is a, um, an umbrella term that includes pre-cleaning followed by sanitizing, sterilizing or disinfecting. Now, a lot of people use disinfection and decontamination interchangeably and it is really important to know that disinfection is a type of decontamination as is sanitization and sterilization. So there's a difference between the two terms. Okay, so just to answer the first question, what exactly is the difference between cleaning and disinfecting? So cleaning uses a detergent, uh, for example, soap and water, whereas disinfecting uses a disinfectant, for example, bleach or jeep or ethanol. Now detergents remove organic matter and dirt, whereas disinfectants are inactivated by organic matter and dirt. Uh, detergents remove pathogens by mechanical friction, whereas disinfectants inactivate or kill pathogens. So it is always important to clean before disinfecting. Okay, now this slide uh, shows two links so that will take you directly to uh, the list of disinfectants that have been approved by the National Regulator for Compulsory Specifications, or NRCS as well as the EPA. And I've also given a reference to the Department of Trade and Industry as they list the active ingredients in these approved disinfectants. Now, if approved disinfectants are not available, then you may use 70 to 90% alcohol, that is ethanol or IPA. You may also use a chlorine solution, which is commonly known as bleach or jet. A 0.1% solution is effective for general environmental disinfection. And a 0.5% is effective for blood and bodily fluid spills. You may also use hydrogen peroxide at or above 0.5%. And the contact time for these disinfectants is at least one minute. So that is the time for the disinfectant to be in contact with the surface in order to effectively kill the pathogen. Now the type of disinfectant will always be determined by the type of surface to be cleaned. And in most instances, it would be needed to contact the manufacturer if you are unsure of which disinfectant to use. Okay, so now to the next question, what exactly is the difference between regular day-to-day -day routine cleaning and deep cleaning? Now for routine cleaning before COVID, uh, we used to do this by using detergents only. We didn't need to disinfect, except for healthcare settings. Now during COVID, we still have to maintain the same cleaning um, procedure or SOP using detergents. Uh, and what is recommended is cleaning at least once a day, but the frequency of course will increase if the workplace operates in shifts, so you will uh, need to clean between shifts, and you may also need to uh, clean when equipment is shared, so you might need to clean between uses. Now, you only need to disinfect only when there is a likelihood of contamination, and this is usually in settings where a high volume of workers, customers, or visitors are likely to touch surfaces. Now, in this case, you would only disinfect high-touch surfaces of entry and exit points, for example, doorknobs, lift buttons, receptionists, desks, etc. Now, deep cleaning differs from regular routine cleaning because this must be conducted every time a COVID-19 case is suspected or identified. Deep cleaning always involves cleaning followed by disinfection, and this is of all affected or contaminated areas including high touch and low touch surfaces. And this must be identified by your incident-based risk assessment. Okay, so just to go back to our diagram and to put this into perspective, our routine cleaning on the left-hand side involves using a detergent, but you would then also disinfect only your high touch surfaces, only if there is a potential for contamination. 
Deep cleaning would involve cleaning as well as disinfecting of all your high touch and low touch surfaces in the affected or contaminated areas as identified by your risk assessment. Okay, now with the next question, why is fogging as a deep cleaning method not recommended? Now, deep cleaning does not mean fogging or spraying or demisting. And the Department of Health, the WHO, the CDC, EPA, etc., do not recommend fogging because disinfectants are inactivated by organic matter. So therefore, you would still need to clean all the areas before fogging, and this is usually not done. Fogging may miss certain surfaces shielded by objects, folded fabric, etc. So if you have a table with a bunch of items on it, and you fog the table and you don't remove the items, it means that the disinfectant could not reach all the areas underneath these items. The most important dis, um, uh, drawback of fogging is the fact that it increases inhalation exposure of the disinfectant to workers and communities. Disinfectants are not made to be inhaled, they are made to be wiped on surfaces. So, the Department of Health and the WHO therefore recommends deep cleaning via wiping a disinfectant on contaminated surfaces using a wipe or cloth only, therefore not spraying. And if you would like a reference stating this, please have a look at the link shown below in the slide. Okay, so the next question, should a business be closed for deep cleaning when a COVID positive case is identified? And should I deep clean every time a positive case is identified? So it is not necessary to close the entire business. If it is possible to close off only the affected area and direct work to another clean area. For example, in the figure shown in the slide, if it is shown that the affected areas are only Lab A and Office A, then you only need to deep clean Lab A and Office A. Now, going to or addressing the second um, question, should I deep clean every time a positive case is identified? Yes, you do have to do this, followed by a risk assessment. So if you now find that your second case has been in contact with Lab B or Office B, then you would have to deep clean lab B and office B and then not lab A or office A. So it is important to deep clean every time you identify a positive COVID case. Okay, now deep cleaning is required for a specific area in a facility that was occupied by a COVID-19 case to enable reoccupation of the affected area as soon as possible and that is in less than seven days, in order for essential services to resume. Deep cleaning is not required in areas that were unoccupied for more than seven days, as the possibility of infectious virus on surfaces would be negligible. Now, a COVID case must have had spent considerable amount of time in the workplace, touched and handled many objects, equipment and surfaces, and had close contact with several co-workers in order to justify deep cleaning. It is not necessary if the positive case simply passed through the workplace without touching any surfaces or spending much time in face-to-face -face communication. Okay, so the next question, should I get an external cleaning company to conduct deep cleaning? And do I need a certificate of cleaning? And uh, the first bullet point, no, deep cleaning does not need to be conducted by an external third party specialist company. And the Department of Health does not require certificates of cleaning. And this is stated again in the link provided in the slide. Oh, so what exactly is required from the employer if in-house cleaning staff should conduct cleaning? Now, no accredited or certified training is needed. However, it is really important to know that cleaners will only be comfortable in conducting cleaning if they are given all the information as well as the appropriate PPE by the employer to conduct cleaning. So for this, they must be trained in the effective cleaning processes, 
appropriate equipment and use of detergents and disinfectants. For example, they must know the correct dilution and application methods, storage and emergency spill procedures. Employers must always maintain the material safety data sheets for all hazardous cleaning products. And this must be readily accessible to all cleaners. It's important to warn workers or cleaners not to mix cleaning products that contain chlorine and ammonia as this will release hazardous vapors. And also label all containers of cleaning products for easy identification. Now, all employers must provide the correct PPE for cleaners, and this includes masks, disposable or utility gloves, dedicated overalls or plastic aprons, and closed toe shoes. Now, clay, um, training should include, uh, should include when to use these PPEs, how to properly don, use, and dock PPEs, etc. And workers should know that they must immediately report any breaches in BPE, such as a tear in gloves or any other potential exposures to their super supervisor. And the employer must always provide these workers with proper hand wash facilities after they have used detergents and disinfectants. Okay, so this brings us to my last slide. And this is when and how should I clean or disinfect certain items? For example, how do I clean carpets? How do I clean the interior or exterior of vehicles? How do I deal with library resources that are shared amongst uh, users? Now, in the first bullet point, I provide a link that would show you exactly the frequency and cleaning of cleaning and disinfection of items in non-healthy workplaces. And this includes everything from telephones to computers to floors to door handles, everything. Uh, in the second bullet point, I provide two links. And uh, these links will tell you exactly the frequency of cleaning and disinfection of items in healthcare workplaces specifically. And then the last bullet point, which is a new link that I'm providing, and this is specifically from the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture. And they give additional instructions on, on how to handle library resources, books, etc. So this might help in more questions. Okay, thank you. That is it. Thank you very much. That was uh, Dr. Charlene and Vegas. And she's given once again one of those very resourceful presentations that you can use to ensure that your workplace is by COVID-19 safe for yourself and your fellow employees. And what I wanted to do at the beginning was to just read the following and to introduce her to you in detail. So Charlene graduated with a BSc in biochemistry and a MSc in human genetics and biochemistry from the University of Johannesburg. Recently, Dr. Andreas obtained a PhD at the University of Vatus Rand with a thesis entitled In Vitro Toxicity Assessment of Dust Emissions from Five South African Coal Mine Tailing Sites. She has worked in the toxicology section at the NIH as a medical scientist since 2010, with the fields of interest being particle toxicology and nanotoxicology. She's also a member of the Toxicology Society of South Africa, TOXA, as well as the South African Council of Natural Scientific Professions. So that was Dr. Charlene Andros from the toxicology section, dealing with the cleaning post-COVID-19 infected worker in the workplace. Thanks, Charlene. Our next presenter is Dr. Tendo. Um, hold on. Is it my part? No? Okay. My apologies, Papela. Uh, Dr. Papela, are you online? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. My apologies with your surname there. Do you have your presentation ready? Yes, I should. Let me just see if I can't okay. uh, share, share the slides from the side. So while you're doing that, a brief introduction. Dr. Tendo Papene, 
uh, completed his MPCHP at the University of Free State, uh, followed by his diploma in occupational health, that's the postgraduate diploma, in 2019 at the University of Witwatersrand. Dr. Papele is currently an occupational medicine, medicine practitioner at the CMJH, now that's Charlotte Matete oh, uh, Academic Hospital, as well as an occupational medical practitioner at Life is Through Health Services in his uh, different capacity. So Dr. Papele, thank you very much for joining us again and making the time to share your practical experience with us and your topic being uh, practical experiences from an occupational medical practitioner. Okay, if you could just you so much, extend your slide to the maximum size. Okay, can everyone see it? Thank you. Okay, um, greetings to everyone um, listening in and thank you again for the opportunity. I'll try my best to be brief. And uh, this is a very semi-structured type of uh, presentation. It's more words and that. I'll just rather more explain sort of what's happening from our side. Um, um, as explained earlier, I'm Dr. Mbapele. I'm at Charlotte Matlake Hospital currently, been here for about three months, uh, sort of managing and running the COVID testing for staff members, as well as uh, the follow-up of positive staff members until they return to work. We've got approximately 6,000 people that we take care of in this clinic. So, um, and we do a lot with COVID, being a COVID hospital and also we've seen quite a lot of numbers which I'm gonna to present to you today and sort of just give you one practical experience we've had and the issues, the main issues when um, having our workers returning back. Um, first, there's just gonna be some statistics. I'm not gonna go into the guidelines. I just had them in the background in case um, people need to see it to just sort of an idea of how we're going about managing our positive cases. Reasons for the rapid rise as the numbers are quite, um, quite um, alarming on our side currently. The challenges that you'll sort of uh, experience as workers return, as well as some recommendations, um, just a few of the major ones that we've seen. I think the other presenters really covered quite a vast majority of this topic. So these are the numbers we have. This is three months. Now, this is taken from the 4th of April until yesterday. So we've seen the total numbers of about 530 active in isolation, be it in a quarantine facility or in their homes, 271. Hospital admissions, we've got 12. This is hospital admissions um, in a normal ward um, or high care facility. ICU admissions are sitting currently at about two. Um, and unfortunately, over the past two weeks, we've had um, two deaths. Um, one being a long-standing cashier who's been working here for some time, known with comorbid conditions. Another person is a, one of our nurses, also known with some um, quite a few comorbid conditions. And what's very interesting here um, is that uh, these people were already booked off for weeks prior to these events happening. So this just puts in that element that everyone must have in the back of their mind that it's not just work exposure, there's a lot of exposure in the community as well. We've had, luckily and unfortunately, uh, 247 recoveries. These are people that now have been reintegrated back into work. So we've sort of had like quite a lot of experience with quite a lot with returnees. Very difficult at first when we started off trying to get the hang of things, and now we've sort of got it um, more more figured out to some extent. Although there's still some challenges here and there. If I'll just give you a quick breakdown from our setting, the hospital setting, nurses are the majority, making up almost half of those numbers. Um, number one is that they are. The majority of employees here in hospitals, mostly nurses. Number two is also they are quite exposed hugely because majority are using public transport according to our data. And some of them, um, what you call this thing, having other partners or essential workers who are also always out and you never know where it is coming from. Doctors are also there, 59 of them. We've got about 74 cleaners. If you look lower down, our admin staff. This is admin staff throughout the entire hospital. Now, this is also important because remember, they don't have any interaction with patients whatsoever, but we're seeing a lot of them being positive as well. This is uh, also has to do with um, that community element that we keep talking about. And then the rest, we've got some theater operators, we've got security staff, pharmacy, radiologists, and other just accounts for everyone else. You found the numbers are less than 10, but um, 
there are all designations pretty much are quite involved now from those that do not touch patients at all sitting somewhere uh, doing filing to those that are right in the front line they all are affected this little pie chart to just give you an idea of what's happening you can see the blue that big area of blue here which is the nurses um, you can see the rate with the doctors we can see our cleaners these are the three major groups then the others sort of just trailing behind the uh, this was just a guide that I'm not going to go into this one. It's very self-explanatory. It's just about how we deal with positive cases. We quarantine them. It was 14 days to my understanding. This is being reviewed and being changed to about eight days. And the current guidelines, I don't know if that will be approved anytime soon, but such discussions are there. Then the main one I'd run you into is just these contacts. This becomes the major issue that happens in the workplace is that once someone tests positive, what happens to everyone else? Now, we've got a hospital setting. We don't get to switch off the machines and close doors for two weeks. So we have to try to find a way to have some continuity of care. And that's why these guidelines are sort of developed. You will see that with our low risk contacts, meaning that if you had your PPE on correctly, if you were social distancing well, should someone or colleague of yours test positive, we would monitor your symptoms for the next two weeks, but not necessarily test you. This is this area here, scenario four. And those only close contacts, those that maybe interacted with a person within 1.5 meters, without PPE, and we don't, we really, really very strict on that. We need to have a statement and see why this happened. Sometimes unavoidable, sometimes it's really just carelessness from people, so we always need to document it. Should the person be at high risk, we still then give them quarantine days, and then come back on day seven for testing. If the person is fine on day eight, they can come back to work. If they're positive, they continue the 14 days. Um, now, those protocols that I've sort of given is that the behind them is that we have to understand that this thing is going to be with us some approximate, probably two years. We're talking about from now until 2022. We're going to see our peak possibly maybe by September or so maximum and start declining down into October and sort of have a normalish December. Next year, probably closer to this time, same thing will happen again up until hopefully we'll get actionable. Um, um, vaccines at some point, hopefully next year, worst case scenario, 2022. So the reality is that this is going to be with us for quite a long time. So the importance of reintegrating this abnormal uh, abnormality into our lives, into our everyday lives becomes a very, very, very important. Getting protocols that are just only trying to create a safe place for the work environment, but also understanding that services need to continue, be it in the private sector or in the public sector, be it hospitals or otherwise. And the guidelines here in the hospital are trying to do that. You've seen the numbers that we've had, but I don't think once they've ever seen that we've closed for whatever reason or shut down the hospital like other institutions, um, clinics and so forth have happened. It's not because we're trying our best to just force people to work. It's just that we're trying our best to follow those guidelines as best as we can, understanding that when someone's ICU or ventilated, you can't just take that whole shift off from work. We still need to find a way to continue working while accommodating these positives that are going to happen every single now and then. And uh, it becomes very difficult to balance that continuity of service as well as uh, um, trying to create a safe place and the more the numbers are. Initially, we're having two, three a day. Now we sit between 25 to 50 sometimes positives a day to encourage people to still continue working and still continue services when such numbers a day becomes quite tricky to balance the two. But we've got a very robust testing system. That's what we have here. We've got a very um, narrow threshold for testing healthcare workers. So we pick them up very quickly, move them out of the system, and that's how we can pick up so many numbers. But it also helps us from containing the spread. As soon as someone is symptomatic, they test the same day, they send home, results come back, continue 14 days. The rest that remain continue working under PPE. If they get symptomatic, same thing over and over and over again. Now, the reasons why this rapid increase happened, whereby we went from three a day to now sitting to 25, 250 a day, is that uh, we reveal that when healthcare workers are interacting with each other, there is a lack of social distancing, there's a lack of PPE use, there's a lack of, um, uh, of hand hygiene. So we've seen that most people are not being infected by the staff members, I mean, by positive patients. We would have expected here that, you know, you're nursing a positive patient and you get infected from them. That's actually not the case. What we've seen is that when people are interacting with patients or patients' family members, they're very meticulous and very strict on their hand hygiene. But as soon as people interact with each other, as a tea break and two colleagues go into a tea room, all sorts of hand hygiene and 
uh, social distancing measures disappear and we find that healthcare workers are infecting each other. That's the main thing that's causing the numbers. Um, then secondly, is something they call, I think, personal protective behavior. This is a new term, I think it's coined in Cape Town, where they talk about our behavior, not just in the workplace, outside. We see people are still gathering. People are having brides, my son's birthday, so I'm inviting the family over. It's a wedding, it's a funeral. Those things are starting to happen, and this is the new word on the block that we need to start tackling. Personal protective behavior, not just inside the workplace, outside the workplace. How should people behave? How should people uh, conduct themselves? Should they be hosting events or anything like that? That becomes, I think, very important if we were to get uh, into stopping the spread, not just in the workplace, but outside as well. Then obviously, like I said, community acquired infections are very high since the easing of the lockdown restrictions. We've seen numbers so outside of the hospital and inside the hospital here with us as well. So the main thing that I want to get into now is just the considerations. I've just jotted down a few. These are real practical scenarios which we are faced with every single day. These are wrote off the top of my head purely because we just see them so many times. We've had 230 something people return and this is what we experience. Most workers actually have mild disease and are physically actually well upon return. When we do their physical examination, there's not really much to really find. The main thing that is destroying most of the people that we see is the psychological trauma. That for me is the biggest highlight that we've seen. It has caused more disease than the virus itself. You must remember that these people have been ostracized sometimes by their family members. An example is a staff member who I called to tell them that they're positive, told them to just go back home, not to come to work, stay there while we find a quarantine facility. Her husband locked her out. Because he's like, you're gonna give it to us, stay where you are. Those people, that person comes back and they're quite traumatized by what happened. There are people who gave it to their partners or parents who succumbed to the virus and died and the family blames them. Those are the realities that you have to deal with as people come back, that this person is not just coming back from a small disease. You might see that, no, you had mild disease, you had a bit of a cough, and now you're fine. But there's more things behind them that are happening, interaction with families, neighbors no longer wanting them to stay on the same street. Those are realities, and it's important for us to remember that and slowly integrate people back into the workplace. Person comes back from two weeks, you don't just assume they're on holiday and boom, back to full duties. We need to find a way to slowly reintegrate these people back into the normal duties. You will see that also those with moderate to severe disease require longer rehabilitations before returning to work. Most of the people that are admitted to high care and um, ICU, we found that even upon returning, residual symptoms like shortness of breath, severe headaches, chest pain, exertional um, uh, so uh, exertional dyspnea, those are very, very prevalent. These people require a very long and lengthy, very important that we have some rehabilitation team, which we can refer to OT, speech, as people back to the normal working place. We know that that means it's gonna deplete the workforce if we have such a lot of people that are very, very critical ill because we know they can go up to six weeks, some that we have now that are still recovering and not yet fit to come back to work. Some will have mild symptoms like headaches, cough, chest pain, sore throat, way past the 14 days. This is actually a common thing. If we have 30, today we have 30 returnees at the clinic. Of these 30, 15 already have really told you that, listen, I'm coughing. And you can see it since sitting in the line, they've been coughing. On day 15 today, they're still coughing. Some still experiencing severe headaches. Some still have sore throat and other male minor ailments like chest pain. It's important that we consider this thing and take it seriously because these symptoms really, really hamper on a person's psyche for them to continue working in a normal, especially if it's a nurse who was maybe working in a COVID ward and you're asking that person to go back to the same mode while they're still not 100%. It becomes important to, again, slowly reintegrate this person to the workplace. Remember that, you know what, these residual symptoms are still there. Get them consulted, get them treated, especially those that are in private who are not maybe in the hospital setting. Make sure that person consults and still has continuous treatment, be it headache tablets or whatever it is that they need. Make sure that that happens because to bring a person who's not 100% back, 100% uh, well back at work is also detrimental and creates an unsafe environment even further. Then importantly, stigma, stigma, stigma. Stigma against returnees to work is big. And this was made bigger by the fact that now retesting was stopped. 
previously we used to retest every single person to test 24 hours apart before returning. That negative test, um, test result at least made it easier for that fresh group to sort of come back and say, listen, I was positive, now I'm negative, and they were accepted. Now we've gone as far as saying, listen, no one must retest. We've seen it many times with our staff members, kids, not private, when we consult um, uh, uh, private uh, bosses saying, listen, people must have a negative test. It becomes very important that we do stigma training. We are fortunate here to have a nice EAP program, which has an anti-stigma um, training program, which we've been trying to conduct in all the departments. It's making a big difference. In other departments, we need to start discussing it. We need to start preparing those that are remaining behind for when the sick people come back to say, listen, guys, this is how we must treat them. This is how we must reintegrate with them. This is why they're not testing again and make that knowledge uh, available because the stigma further causes a lot of anxiety for all those that are returning. And then last, it's not a nice topic to talk about. We also have malingering. We have those people who have come back from 14 days, are otherwise fine, but want to milk the situation for what it is. They want another week, they want another two weeks. They have symptoms that are not resolving. When you check them physically and do all the tests, you're not finding anything. It's not a nice topic to talk about, you know, to accuse people of cheating the system for lack of a better word. There's many reasons why people would malinger. Sometimes it's anxiety and fear of going back to the same place where they assume they got the disease. Sometimes it's just people that we know are taking um, chances, for lack of a better word. So it's important to pick those people up. It's going to happen. Someone's going to come back after 14 weeks. No symptoms whatsoever. But when they walk into the hospital, back to work, I can't think. I've got a headache. I've got this. But when they're home, they're still going about their life. They're traveling. They're doing whatever it is that they're doing. So it's important to pick those people up and spot them. Then uh, the challenges that you sort of have mainly is just the anxiety and fear. Like this is the biggest threat to the continuity of someone's going to test positive and you're going to tell the rest of the people, have a debrief with them and they're going to say, listen, we're using our PPE. We sort of fine and we are not in close contact, but we're scared to work. We're scared of the environment. Is it clean enough? We will not, we will not get it. Tackling anxiety and fear for me is one of the most important um, tools that we have to ensure continuity of services. If we do not do that, we have staff members that are not motivated, staff members that are anxious, that will not deliver services in the manner that we want them to. A lot of absenteeism starts happening amongst the remainder of the staff members. So tackling that anxiety by educating them becomes very important. Number two that we see challenges is that there's different protocols used by different sectors. In the healthcare setting, we're saying low risk contacts continue working. You go to a school or go to maybe a retail where one person tests positive, they shut down the whole place for two weeks. These inconsistencies, unfortunately, do create a lot of anxiety, especially for us, we still have to continue working despite positives happening around us. People sit there like, listen, my friend works in a clinic, the clinic shut down for two weeks, why can't we do the same? So those are the challenges that you're gonna have to face and you have to have answers prepared for them. Do we have one guideline that governs everyone? It might not be so easy in such a condition, but those are things that we have to consider keeping up with disinfection of workplaces. Now, the reality with the cleaning is that ideally you want to clean and disinfect the place every time there's a positive. But if you're looking at the numbers and how frequently they're occurring, is it possible for you to keep up with that? Will you be able to bring deep cleaning every single time a positive happens and you wipe um, and you come in fog and clean the area? The reality we're saying 60% of the people are going to get this condition at some point. You've got a department and you've got 20 people working there. 12 of them are going to get it. If the curve is flattened properly, you're looking at about maybe two a week. Are you going to clean every single week deep clean? In private, be it in government or private, it becomes financially and physically just not feasible anymore to shut down clean for three hours every single time. So these are the challenges that you will have. In some areas, like in an ICU, we can't even remove those patients to allow cleaning. So we need to come up with practical solutions and realities and say, listen, how is our cleaning schedule going to be? Do we have to clean the whole building just because someone in a certain floor, in a certain section, tested positive? Because the reality is, as the positives happen, as it increases, it becomes impossible to keep up with it. But once you set the precedence that you want to clean, uh, deep clean an area every single time, it must be done consistently for everyone. Um, so that is one of the challenges that we have in our section here. 
we've got sections where by every single day someone tests positive to shut it down and clean deep clean becomes difficult so we resulted to just increasing the number of cleaning people in those departments and have cleaning three to four times a day as the government as their requirements say and this cleaning is not fogging and all those things i look at the guidelines i don't remember where i saw foggy they really emphasize on just using the proper solutions and wiping surfaces down as the previous speaker was once saying so it's important that this function just is not left to the cleaners everyone must do it doctor nurse porter you must be responsible for your own station get the proper solution wipe your surface before you get to work wipe it after lunch wipe it again before you leave it does not have to get a special person just to come and wipe your table that you are sitting on then um, the rapid changing of guidelines the guidelines change so quickly it's so difficult to keep up with them but it's important that someone gets assigned in the workplace to say listen you are there as a health and safety officer you must keep up with the guidelines and communicate them this one week we were a few months ago we were only testing people that traveled then we tested people that work in healthcare facilities now we're testing everyone a week ago 14 days was recommended with repeat testing now we no longer repeat the test now all of a sudden it's eight days they change so frequently you need someone who's responsible point someone and say listen make sure you keep up with all the guidelines educators and updaters every single time so we can be current then a very sore topic which is quite difficult is the reallocation of vulnerable employees we've got employees with severe comorbidities that are known to cause severe disease if you get COVID. what do we do with those employees if i'm saying now that they're postulating that the disease is here until 2020 is it possible to for people with comorbidities to work from home that long the reality is that no is it possible for nurses and doctors and physiotherapists to work from home. No, cleaners, they can't work from home, security. So we have to find a way to accommodate these people in the workplace because of the reality is that most people are gonna exhaust their sick leave, exhaust their incapacity, and at some point eventually lose their job if it gets to that point. But we still need to understand that this is not their fault and we need to protect our asthmatics, our hypertensives, our renal failures. This is a big topic in the workplace. Find areas which are safe. Be it you make it safe by eliminating you know, the hierarchy of control, putting extra PPE, or whether you're putting equipment ventilation, but we need to make sure we protect those people, find jobs that are suitable for them. Those that are using public transport, if it's possible, try to find a way in which they can be transported in a safe manner to work and we accommodate the reality of that at some point they're going to be asked to come to work, but how can you make it safe for them? It's no clear, clear guideline of what exactly you do with them. The reality is that currently working from home is not possible for all sectors. What we need to do as people in the employment sector is create safe areas in the workplace, risk assessment, find what is a green zone or low risk area, put the adequate PPE, the adequate controls, and then accommodate those vulnerable employees into those areas. And importantly, where you cannot do not do not what you call discriminate against those people. Because at the end of the day, it's not your fault COVID yet, neither is it theirs. But unfortunately, fortunately, their lives matter. We need to find a way to integrate them in a manner which keeps them safe, but still allows them to maintain their livelihood and work and earn a living. Keeping staff motivated as colleagues become positive, or unfortunately sometimes succumb to the disease. Now we've got two deaths here. Each death is heartfelt. Um, it's a department, it's friends, it's people that have been working together. One person was working here for 25 years. Everyone knew him, everyone who's ever parked in here in this hospital has went past that man. They all described him as very friendly. And now, unfortunately, due to this disease, his life was, was taken. It becomes difficult to now keep whoever is remaining still working, still motivated. Those are the realities that you're going to experience in your workplace. At some point, unfortunately, someone will get this disease and not make it. Those that are remaining will have a lot of anxiety, a lot of hurt, a lot of questions that need answers. So it's important that you prepare for that day. Have those conversations beforehand with them. Don't always wait for something to happen. I always tell everyone that at some point you must make the reality, you must accept that you're gonna get that call that you are positive. It is not the time now to think who's gonna take care of your child if you're a single mom or a single dad, who's gonna watch your mother if you're staying with a parent. You need to have had those conversations beforehand and prepared so that when the day comes, you sort of just action everything as best as you can. Then obviously, these are just a repetition, the post-traumatic uh, stress, of COVID and the guilt, some staff members, like I know here, there are some people who maybe have recovered and have came back, but unfortunately have lost a family member. And they are the ones being blamed 
for giving that family member uh, um, or passing the infection onto them. Those are the realities and this causes a lot of stress. It's important that you identify these people. They could be struggling, maybe with return turn to substance abuse and all other vices to manage the stress. Identify them, have an open door policy, make them feel comfortable to approach their manager or their wellness department to discuss these issues and get those solved. And obviously the stigma, like I said, I touched upon it, becomes a big challenge in the workplace when people return. Excuse me. Given those, I've just got a few recommendations. Um, these are just the practical ones that I think I wish you take priority. Number one is education. I wrote it three times because I cannot overemphasize how important it is to make sure people are educated on what, on what COVID is, on how it spreads, who is at risk, who is a vulnerable and company is using with regards to positive cases, with regards to contact tracing. This is not something you do once on a Friday and leave it. It's every day. In our world, we have COVID training every morning. We teach people how to wear PPE every single morning. We have a debrief session every single morning, and it does not need experts, it just needs you guys as the department to sit down in your small corner and discuss it. Something you don't know, someone else in the same department has an answer. So that's very, very important that people continue in that manner of educating. That solves a lot of um, um, a lot of stigma issues. And the truth is the EAP, it's important that we understand the psychological trauma that comes with COVID. Like I said, for me, I feel it is more deadlier than the virus itself. We've seen lots of positives, very, very few people have unfortunately passed away, but many have had psychological trauma since this COVID um, um, pandemic has started. Have a good program. For those in private sectors who do not have, you need to identify a company or a service provider who can provide those services, social work, psychology, psychiatry, if necessary, for those returning back and those that remain behind, you know, they're also affected. When someone comes back and you think they might still have COVID, it makes you very uncomfortable in the workplace. So we must have these programs for them to encourage them and educate them. Anti-stigma training, it does exist. I know there's a program here. There are many service providers, I think, that are starting to jump onto that. It's a very important thing, especially for people that are returning, training those that are going to accept them that listen, this is how we must treat them, this is how we must go about our business going forward. And then update and educate staff on guidelines constantly. Every single day, like I said, have a conversation. People must sing these guidelines, must sing COVID out of their heads. That's the only way you can get over the fear and the anxiety. And then lastly, just be accommodative, be empathetic. When a person comes back, you don't just shove them back into normal routine all at once. This person's been away for two weeks, they've been sick, they need time to recover, slowly reintegrate them over time back into the workplace. Thank you so much. Um, I tried to touch on as many things as I could. There's no real clear one thing that I could really give to you guys. This is just from our side. Practically, these are the challenges that we have with our people that are returning. And I'm just hoping I can prepare you guys. Some of them I don't have answers to. It's just for people to have in the back of their minds and hopefully answers can emerge from there as to how do we deal with stigma? How do we deal with post-traumatic stress and, and so forth? Thank you so much for the opportunity. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was Dr. Ntendo Mopele. Um, thank you for your practical experience and exposure with regard to what happens in a clinical setting and in a hospital. And uh, at this point, I also would like to say thank you to Dr. Mollen Mogombo, from the occupational medicine specialist from the occupational medicine section here at the NIH. And a thanks to Dr. Sayuri Pillay from Witt School of Public Health and the NIH, um, dealing with the control of workplace high-risk areas. And then that was followed by Dr. Charlene Andreas, dealing with the cleaning post-COVID infected worker in the workplace from the NIH's toxicology section. And then um, Dr. Tendo, uh, who had dealt with the practical experience um, from an occupational medical practitioner that's dealing with real cases and we've heard how stigma and the psychosocial aspects of the risk assessment is critical. So Dr. Papele from the um, uh, occupational medicine section, or rather a is that the occupational health service mm -hmm. at the hospital providing us with this very practical experience. 
So at this point, we want to just say thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, on this particular program dealing with a return to a post-COVID-19 illness slash lockdown. Um, we will now be dealing with the remainder of the questions in the Q&A uh, Q section. And we're going to ask our panelists to stay behind to ensure that that is dealt with. Um, so I want to thank at this point our panelists, and that's Moses Makone, that's Ibrahim uh, Olimini, uh, Dr. Tanusha Singh, uh, we got that right. Uh, yes, Dr. Oded um, Valmink, uh, and then our panelist who's been helping out as well, uh, Jeanette Mangani. I uh, hope I've got everybody, and Dr. Umpume Ndaba for covering the QA section, your questions here at the bottom of the screen. And we hope in the next uh, few minutes before half past 12 to eliminate all those questions. Please do not ask any admin questions there. No data related, no questions regard to certificates, anything. This Q&A is only for questions related to the content of the presentations. If you've got any other questions, please type it in the chat box next door or email us at info at nih.ac.za. So that is info at nih.ac.za. And if you've got any questions related to data, please email HWS training at witshealth.co.za. Any data related questions, please email it to HWS training at witshealth.co.za. All other admin questions related to this particular webinar, all the presentations, this video recording, and other resources are placed on our website, www.nih.ac.za, and that's a zero-rated website. Please visit the website, www.nih.ac.za. No admin questions in the Q&A box. We've asked our panelists to stay on a little longer to co cover all the questions there. If there is non-presentation questions or comments there, we are going to push it over to the uh, third column uh, for general comments that doesn't belong there. So at this point in time, I want to say thank you very much to all of you who have uh, joined us today in this NIH webinar in partnership with the Vitsouth Consortium supported by the Health and Welfare CETA on the topic Return to Work Post COVID Illness. And we now place the task and the responsibility on your shoulders to ensure that in your workplaces, your workplace is COVID-19 prepared and prevention is in place for those who are already working, for those who are returning, and for those workers who may have been affected and infected by COVID-19 that you eliminate all stigma and that you have a supportive working environment that reintegrates that particular employee into the workplace so that we can all become productive contributors to the main mission of our workplaces wherever we may be working. So thank you again to our, pan our panel of presenters. That's Dr. Molan Mogombo, Dr. Sayuri Pillay, Dr. Charlene Andreos, and Dr. Tendo Mapele. I hope I've got his surname correctly. My apologies, it's not on the program. And to our panelists who've been answering all the questions and who's remaining online to answer the questions, thank you very much for your contributions. To our IT and information services colleagues who I'm looking at at the moment, thank you for their contributions to making this webinar possible. Goodbye. <laughs>